we're going to look at a specific market now as an example. Keep in mind, uh, then, that we'll look at the m- market for milk in Montreal. And keep in mind, too, that in this market, we've got many buyers, many milk drinkers, and we've got many sellers, presumably dairy farmers. So there's no game theory going on here. There's no negotiation. Uh, now, in this, uh, in this case, I'm going to take a look first at the buyers, or what we call the demand curve, uh, demand function sometimes. And, and, ma- and mathematically, this is how we do this in economics. We, we uh, form the hypothesis that there's some kind of quantity demanded, that's QD, uh, which is really the amount of milk people would like to purchase added up across a whole series of, of households or families or individuals. And then we say that this quantity, the amount of milk people would like to buy, is based on a series of factors. Here I've got them as X1, X2, X3, X4, and so on. I don't know what these factors are. These, these would be various uh, variables or things that influence a person's desire to drink milk. So let's take a look at these uh, examples. And I'm going to do this by um, uh, taking a look at your, uh, your textbook, the Sex and Fortuna book. And this is what it lists. It lists, is, for example, the prices of related goods, people's income, and so on. Uh, it, I'm going to mention critically here as well the price of milk, of course. These are the factors that would determine whether uh, a person would want to buy milk. One is the price of milk, how rich they are, that's their income, the number of buyers, the nature of the population, for example... Um, get my red pen here, uh, whether there's kids or not in the, fa- in the family. Uh, the price of related goods would be things like, uh, I, I don't know, uh, cereal. It does, uh, does the family drink um, uh, cereal, or uh, rather drink uh, coffee, uh, but then also does the family drink juice? Um, for example, the, 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 uh, and you'll notice something too. We don't put in whether they drink cereal or coffee. We put in the price of those related items. Uh, key one here is taste and price. Some people like milk. Some people don't. Some people are lactose, and di- di- lactose in- intolerant. And, and that generically goes into the, the term tastes or preferences. Uh, the, the modern term for this would be orientation because in economics, we tend to believe that an individual's tastes or preference are more or less fixed. They don't vary that much. Um, there may be uh, reasons they might change, but it's a bit, a bit like some people are left-handed, some people are right-handed, and that's the way you are. And uh, I mean, you, you can change over time, but it's unlikely to change much. Uh, I put in here information and advertising. Advertising, information is maybe uh, might change your mind about certain things. Does advertising have an effect? I think so in some ways. Uh, for example, if you've never tasted milk before, you don't know what it is, You've never had it. Well, in that case, uh, advertising or information might get you to try it, to see whether you like it or not. So that's where, uh, think of a movie, a new movie that comes out. You don't know if it's a good movie or a bad movie. So that, that may affect you. But for things that we you've tried quite a bit, you kind of know whether you like it or not. You, uh, well, it might. Uh, this is a debate. Uh, as we'll look uh, further, uh, sometimes they refer to the quantity demanded versus the demand. I'll be looking at that, but that frequently concerns whether or not we're talking about the price of milk or the price of these other these other factors. Okay, so um, yeah, here I've already put the coffee in here. So I do a little thought experiment here, um, which is what incidentally Albert Einstein did when developing his theory of relativity. It's called the Gedanken versus uh, is uh, the idea. I, Crazy! I'm going to do a survey of all the families in Montreal. So like, imagine this crazy idea. I'm going to do like go and knock on everybody's door and ask them how much milk they want to have for the next four weeks. And I'll, t- I'll tell them I'm going to deliver the milk to their door. Okay, so when I conduct this experiment, I'm going to, of course, it's completely hypothetical. I'm going to keep everything constant. That means to say all of these various other factors like cereal, coffee, people lactose and number of kids in the family, uh, information about advertising, all of these things are held constant, they're frozen. The only thing I'm going to change is the price. And keep in mind too, I'm only looking at the buyers. I'm not going to look at where the milk comes from. So if anybody says, where am I going to, don't worry, I've got lots of dairy farmers, they'll deliver the milk to your house. So uh, you, you, as I say, you can imagine I'm going up to each door and this is a thought experiment, so everything else is frozen, people's income, their jobs, their situation, the situation, the economy, information, and each 
person I speak to, they're not playing a game. So it's not like on the desert island. They're actually going to answer me honestly. Yeah, I want three liters or I want six liters or we don't drink milk in this household, whatever. And I'm going to add up all of these numbers. There's responses I get from all the, the families that after conducting my experiment. A uh, little point about this is uh, in economics, we refer to this thought experiment, this method of what I'm doing is called caterus paribus, which means everything else held constant. What that means is the only thing I'm changing, I'm changing one thing, I'm changing the price. I'm going to change the price of milk. You'll see in a second. Uh, but everything else, as I say, income is all held constant. Uh, there's another term in, econo- in Latin that's often sometimes confused called caveat emptor. Caveat emptor means buyer beware. That just means if you're going to purchase something, be careful what you're doing because you know you, the seller may not be honest with you. The, I'm not invoking anything related to caveat emptor here. I'm just talking about this concept of ca- caterus paribus, which is a bit like Occam's razor, is that I'm keeping it really, really simple, just changing one variable. So let's try and do this now. Uh, 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 this is the graph I'll use to illustrate. This is the second graph we'll have in the course, and I'm going to be using this quite extensively, so get used to it. Uh, on the vertical axis, I don't put Y. I put P for the price, dollars per liter. Horizontal axis, I'm going to put Q, not X for millions of liters of milk. And uh, I'm going to start this little experiment with quoting a price of $3. So now what I'm going to do is go to all these households and ask them how much milk they want to purchase if the price is $3. So I don't know. I knock on all these various doors and I come up with a number of, uh, let's say, $3. They happen to say, yeah, I want milk. I'm willing to buy five liters, six liters, eight liters. I don't know. Maybe some people say, I don't drink milk. I don't care what the price is. I'm not going to have it. When I add across all of these households, I get 20 million liters. Okay. Put an M for million. That's it's a number I just invented as an example. So after conducting this whole experiment, I then go back and do it all a second time. But now I have a different price. You know, I've shown it. We can call this point A that I wanted to start with here. Uh, now, imagine I conduct the whole experiment a second time, but now I drop the price down to $2.80. And my question first is, well, what do you think is going to happen? And I have a suspicion that it will probably be a higher number, more than $20 million. Why? And I'll give you two reasons. One is there could be families that previously said, we don't drink milk, I don't want any milk. But they might now say, hey, two eighty. dollars you know what, I'll have one liter. Yeah, there might be friends coming over who ought to put milk in their coffee, so I'll have a, just give me a liter. There could also be people that previously said, eh, I want four liters. You know what? Just bring me an extra one, just in case. Uh, maybe the kids want to have more milk this, this week. So I think for those two reasons, the price is going to be, the, the quantity will be higher. I mean, there'll be some people who say, yeah, I don't drink milk, I don't care what the price is, I don't want it. And there could be some that say, yeah, three liters, I don't care, I need three liters, I don't drink more than that. But I think on balance, now how much more? I don't know. I'm just going to put in a number here. Let's say 25 million. So now I can show that on my graph over here. I've gone at 280, 25, and I can call this point over here point B, for example. Now, I do the experiment again. I This time, though, when I go and knock on the door, I say it's going to be $2.60. Now, in this case, once again, by the same logic, I think this number is going to be maybe a little bit higher. So I go to 30 million put this dot over here, 30 million. And then I do the fourth time, quoting a price of $2.40. Here I've got it down here. And I'm going to say this, call this point C here. This is point D. And now I've got 35 million as an example. Okay. I can now draw the uh, a line through these four points. And we call this a demand curve. It's actually a line, but we still, in economics, we frequently do that. We call something a curve when it's a line. We call it a line when it's a curve. But uh, And there's no reason why it has to be a straight line. I've just invented these numbers so it comes out. You'll notice I put a little one down here because this is my first experiment. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say I'm going to change something. In this case, what I'm going to change is, remember those factors I had before, uh, that were frozen or held constant, and I was only changing the price, I'm going to change the population now. So that means one of the other factors has changed, which means I have to do an entirely new experiment. So uh, I'm going to call that the scenario with baby boom. So I'm going to have a bunch of kids now. Get rid of this here. Uh, so imagine there's a bunch of kids, I don't know, nine months ago, like a, this COVID thing or whatever, it's like a 
block out. Now there's all these kids, zillions of kids. So families have kids. So what's going to happen as a result when I knock on people's door? I'm going to start the experiment once again with $3. So I think as a result, all the kids, when I knock on the door, somebody's going to say, well, yeah, we need more milk. Babies drink milk. So I get a higher number. I'm going to put $25 million here. And now I can put this over at point here like this. And then I can put at, uh, say, this is going to drop the price again. I guess it's going to be $30 million. I can put a dot over here like this. And $35 million when I drop it down to two sixty. dollars So I'll be at this point over here. And then I'll be down at $40 million. Again, I'm dropping the price under the scenario of lots of kids. And so now I can draw a new line through all these points. And I can call this the demand curve with scenario two. Call this the baby boom scenario. So as a result, you can see that in this case, the demand curve shifts to the right. So we can say, when I knock on people's door, if of course, if I change the price, lowering the price, I'm just drawing the curve. But if I change some other factor, something other than the price, for example, having tons of kids, uh, then uh, more uh, numbers at the door, call that numbers like this, then the demand curve is going to shift to the right. So let's get rid of all these kids. Now I'm going to do another experiment. So I'm going to do a, a third scenario. So just get rid of them. I'm going to go back to the baseline or benchmark scenario, the original scenario. Now what I'm going to do is suggest, let's say there's news reports that there's a tainted milk in California. Okay, so that means to say there are news reports that milk in California, I don't know, it's toxic, it's dangerous or something. I don't know. Now, keep in mind, the milk I'm delivering to people is going to be perfectly safe Quebec milk. There's no problem with it. But, of course, there's going to be some people, oh, I don't know, I've heard stories about this milk. And Even if I reassure people that it's safe milk, I suspect that when I go and knock on their doors and say it's $3, they're going to say, well, I don't really know, I don't really need milk. I'm going to have a lower number than the $20 million case. What happens if I drop the price now to two eighty? Now, previously, when I look at this, you can see that it would, well, people want to drink more milk because it's cheaper. But if you stop and think about this tainted milk story, uh, think of this in game theory terms. Now people might think, hey, he's, this guy's negotiating with us. If he's dropping the price, it means he's got too much milk. He's trying to get rid of it. This milk is not safe. So is it really true that the people are going to start to want to buy more milk? Uh, it's an important concept because the price in economics refers to the terms of trade. That is how much money or how much you have to give up to get something else. But people often use the price as a signal of quality. Now, I'm not saying that that's incorrect. Uh, people frequently do it for things they don't know much about, like wine. Some people might say, oh, it's not a very good bottle of wine. It's only $20 or $15 a bottle. You have to get good wine. You have to pay more than $30 or $40, something like that, $50 a bottle. Uh, in my mind, I'm always thinking, well, wait, I mean, it, it, the price tells you how much you have to pay. It doesn't necessarily signal the quality. Be cautious about that. And I think the confusion here is that uh, we're using the price as an indication, not just how much to pay, but it could be a sign that, hey, this guy's trying to get rid of this lousy, crummy milk that nobody wants to buy. In any case, I'm going to stick with the idea that it's simply the terms of trade. People are well informed about the quality of the milk except that it's tainted, so they don't, aren't well-informed. And uh, I'm going to stay with the idea that we drop the price. So over here, we've got 15 for $3. We've got 20 for uh, 280 Drop it again to $25 million. And I've got this point over here. And then I go down to 30 here, $30 million. And we can draw a whole new line like this, in which case now the demand curve shifts to the left. So if it's less, then the demand curve shifts to the left. Bear in mind, too, that if the price falls, you're going down the curve. This is the idea of the quantity demanded versus the demand. Let's summarize all of this. Uh, what I did here is I kept all of these things constant. These were frozen. And the only thing I changed was the price. That was to draw the curve. But then I changed the population. So my first experiment was just changing the price. 
Then I changed something here. I had to conduct a whole new experiment. When I conducted my new experiment with new kid, because something I changed here that was previously frozen, it resulted in the demand curve shifting to the right. So if you change anything, draw a sharp line here between the two. If I'm changing the price of milk, same curve. If here, it's a new curve. If something changes here, that would mean that people would want to have more milk, the demand curve shifts to the right. If there's rumors of tainted milk, if I change something down here, lower incomes, for example, coffee that's more expensive, then I'd expect lower numbers at the door, in which case the demand curve shifts to the left. Now, there's a third possibility. I change something, information, news reports, something, and it has no effect on demand. For example, I don't know, let's say there's a, a typhoon in Japan, which is tragic for the people living in Japan, but I don't think it will have much effect on the desire of people in Montreal to drink milk, unless they've got family in Japan or something, in which case the curve doesn't shift. 